Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first call for this year. I'm really excited to learn something new. And uh, today we are going to talk about, you know, the topics around the Dataverse. So we know like Dataverse is a core for any power platform projects. Everything start around this. And without wasting the time, I would really like to hand over and listen something from the Thomas that what he has it in his bucket to tell around the data wars. Guys, have a nice evening, a nice day wherever you are. I, I think for today we have an interesting topic again, uh, and maybe you can count down one, two, three, or three, two, one. It is a little bit about Copilot. So yesterday, let me tell you the quick story, and then I also want to share the screen a little bit because I want to show you something absolutely awesome. Um, yesterday, we had the Teams uh, Community Day 2024, and actually, it was only 20% about Teams and 80% uh, about Copilot. And I guess it is the topic um, we should talk about. Uh, I think within our group, we will definitely do it um, another, so I think also a little bit advertisement for my other AI and Copilot uh, user group, which is upcoming. You can find this on Meetup. Anyhow, um, we are also talking about Copilot because it is still the hot topic. And now um, I should talk a little bit about it. And I said, we'll be around a minute, maybe two. And I'm lazy, so that means um, why not let AI help me to find a pitch? And um, since it's a two minute, minute pitch, I could make it as a kind of management pitch, or I said, let's do a sales pitch because also most likely it is super interesting. Now, let me definitely share my lovely window and I go for Copilot first. So hopefully you should see the Copilot um, window. I hope you yeah. do. That is great. Um, you know, actually I should put that nice sticker in front of me. Do you see my screen? <laughs> from the team's um, community day. Yes. Okay, Copilot. I, I asked Copilot, the standard version for, for sure, is that made me an interesting sales pitch uh, for Copilot and why it is a hot topic. I think that's a good question, Sean. Sure. A sales pitch is pretty, pretty short and makes someone interested in it. And the hot topic means like why we should talk about it. And if you believe it or not, um, it completely misunderstood everything. As you see, Copilot for sales, for sales. I did not speak about Copilot for sales. And here we come to the topic, why Copilot is so interesting. So you have Copilot in Bing, you have Copilot anywhere else in your, your M365 apps. You have it for Dynamics, um, which is also interesting. You can even have developer environments um, where you can use, utilize it yourself. And um, that's one part. And uh, again, it is because it's Microsoft, it's even talking about licenses. <laughs> which is um, higher. <laughs> I don't know if you are interested if I tell you something about sales productivity, which is, by the way, awesome um, if you are looking into Dynamics 365. But now I come to another open AI and let me ask the same question here. It looks different, right? So now we are actually a chat GPT. Um, also, there are integrations possible for sure with, with, with Copilot, but at least even with the version 3.5, it came something out. And now I can tell you something. Yes, I love Copilot because it definitely helps me making um, my pitches much more faster. I did this for another webcast series, which is coming, and I had no idea what to what to talk about. I asked, by the way, both. And yes, if you have an enterprise co-pilot, it is definitely a little bit better, um, so to speak. And it just gives me ideas, even in in like like this one, for example, in the middle. I totally like these ideas of like end-to-end -end project management. Yes, if you have your data, and that brings me back later um, to all our other folks in our call today. Um, if you have data, if you have data lakes, if you have um, maybe even third parts of machine learning, you can summarize. And that's um, awesome. And that means like your pitches, um, your presentations and everything else becomes definitely faster. The main problem we humans have is getting into a flow. What does this mean? Getting into a flow means like when you start with something from scratch, you need to step over the hurdle to just go into a writing or presentation mode flow. And if that's happened, everything is fine, but it takes time. And if you don't have time, 
why not let that initial thought come from a co-pilot? It is something not replacing our thoughts, but actually it triggers creativity. And that is something I guess during the next sessions, I definitely want to talk about it. Beside our firm, also we have interesting trainings in, internally and I hope everyone made it. Um, also the human aspects, governance aspects um, on AIs and also what could be go wrong and why you still need humans. That's my one. And yeah, Marius, yeah. I think you yes. will continue with a, another <laughs> awesome topic. Well, yeah. maybe slightly less hot and interesting, um, but I recently <laughs> had uh, data flows in my projects and data flows are pretty interesting, I think, because so data flows uh, let you hook up to many data sources, basically the same ones you can access with Power BI because it's the same technology with Power Query and then let you import the results into your Dataverse. And data flows, unlike normal Power Automate flows, only the owner can edit them. And Microsoft made a cool feature. So you see here, this is my data flow. And if I go to all data flows and search for someone else, so that will be Alan Steiner, um, I can see his data flows, only one currently, and I can change the owner, for example, to myself because I'm an administrator. And this is all fine. And um, so this uh, flow, data flow was imported by Alan Steiner with a solution here. But the thing I want to talk about is what happens if you import a solution with an app registration or with a guest user. And that doesn't work. Well, the import works, but if we, for example, try to search for Marius Wodke here, in the search box, we won't find him. And also trying the hashtag, oh, sorry, that's not a hashtag, that's a hashtag, doesn't work, and deployment, the name of the app, does also not work. So this search only works for regular members of the tenant or um, users that are synced from on-premises to that tenant. So via the uh, Azure AD sync, I think now it's called Entra Connect. Um, so only the regular members uh, are being found here. And this is why I want my tip today um, to only import data flows with a regular user, not via pipelines with an app registration. And in that sense, make or put them to a separate solution that you move manually. That way you always be sure that this will be working correctly. Thanks, Then I'll hand over to Ambesh. I think you have something around Postman. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Marius. It was really interesting to know about that. So, yeah, uh, I would just quickly share my screen and then we can talk something around the Postman. Um, yeah, just let me know once my screen is visible to everyone. And uh, yeah, so today we will see the possibilities of play around, you know, the Dataverse APIs uh, via Postman. So. Maybe let's start with a short intro of product and the tool on which I'm going to talk and show some quick demos there before before we do. So, you know, the Microsoft Dataverse API is a powerful tool that allows the developers to work with the data, tables, columns, definitions, um, you know, in the Dataverse. It also provides, a you know, the development experience that can be used across a wide variety of the programming languages platforms and the devices. At the same time, whereas Postman is a popular API, you know, the application programming interface platform that simplified the API lifecycle, making it easier for the developers to build, uh, to test, to modify, and even to document the APIs, which is really interesting. It also offers the range of the features, including the comprehensive set of the API tools and API repository, you know, for the easy storage and the collaboration, workspaces for the organizations and the governance rules 
for quality assurance and it's a user friendly interface eliminate the need of writing the http client network code making api development more efficient and accessible like i, I do still i still do remember my old days when we have to write a long c sharp query um, you know c sharp scripts or something to connect one system to the other system so now it's quite and just for the testing so it's it's quite convenient now and uh, then basically like how we can do uh, five golden steps so we have to prepare the prerequisites then uh, and in the prerequisites we need to get the urls of the organization we need to install the postman we need to sign up there and so on then we need to register, register an application uh, to the azure active directory or the entry id we, we call now then we have to configure the postman to connect the dataverse instance we have to test the api access from the postman before making any final operations or the magic over the dataverse so i think um, let's uh, let, now let's jump in the real world and see the magic so i will just quickly share uh, the step by step process of uh, my browser over there and um, if you can see on my screen right now um, what you have to do first so the first thing we have to go to the power platform admin center we have to go to our environment uh, from there and the environment after going to the environment uh, when we sh when we see the uh, the details of the environment you can find the environment url here so that is the first step second step you have to go to the postman.com downloads you have to download the uh, postman based on if you're using the mac you're using the windows windows 64 or whatever the platform so you have to download it you have to register sign up there because then you can save your all of the request into the collection and so on uh, for the longer longer uses the step three here you have to go to the office.com and from the office.com you have to uh, go to the admin center there so on the left plates or the left navigation you will find the admin center the moment you will click here you will be re redirected to, to the admin center there and from the admin center uh, you have to go to the identity and the moment you click on the identity the azure portal will open so this is the thing like a different ways to reach there here also you can directly go to the portal.azure.com and just, um, the, this will open for you um, here you have to basically search uh, the app registration so once you are into the app registration um you have to make a new app registration here so i already created just to save the time what all the things we have to keep it in the mind so the first thing is um when uh, we talk about the authentication so on the authentication we have to just quickly uh, provide the you know we have to add the platform web and we have to provide the redirect url as an https localhost so step one after that, we have to go to the API permissions. And here we really need to be very cautious because then we have to example, select the add a permission. Then we have to search the dynamic CRM from the list from the Microsoft APIs. Once you select the dynamic CRM uh, API from the list, you have to click on the checkbox user impersonations. Don't forget to click it. If you don't click it, yeah, you will, your authentication or your, um, you know, credential won't be, won't be, um, giving the right results then after this once you step uh, once you perform this step you have to quickly go to the uh, you can check the manifest file because there are some sometimes we might need to change on uh, the we, not, we might need to make the changes to the manifest that is not really important but once you will get or encountered sometimes such errors you can have a quick look into that one um, like an example if you are uh, i can just name some of some of the parameters so one parameter there should be example auth allow implicit implicit flows if you are really validating with the implicit way so you have to make it true the same way there are one or two more options or the parameters there you need to change the value from none or from false to the true uh, one thing i just forget to mention uh, once you are in the api permission you really need to grant admin consent for the counter so so there you can just simply grant the admin access and yeah this is this is um, the things what we have to take care about there. The next step is um, once I'm I have the app created uh, or the yeah app registration, then I have an app ID. Uh, I have to go to the environment, so I can I can just quickly walk through. So in the environment, you have to go to the settings, and in the settings you have to go to the user permission and then application users. Once you are in the app users, you have to add the new app users. From here you have to uh, select 
whatever we have created right now. So because I have already added, it's not available, but suppose there's an, another app registration you did, it will reflect here. You have to select it here and then you have to assign the particular business units, whatever the business units you would like to grant the nexus. I have only one default one, so that's what uh, I have one. Uh, and only one is popping up or dropping off there. And then you have to assign the proper security role. So system customizer, system admin, or any role which you would like to perform uh, or you, you would like to make an operations there to perform it. The next step is um, we have to go to the developer resources and again like people could ask how we can go uh, so it's simple like if you are into your dynamic crm instance you have to simply go from uh, setting gear icons to the advanced settings once you are on the advanced settings then you can navigate quickly to the uh, you know customization group in the customization group or the area you have a customization in the customization you will find the developer resource so once you are here then you will see uh, this window and from here you need to get the basically the API URL from there. So it shows uh, what was in your 9.1, 9.2. So right now every instance will get the 9.2. But if somebody using the old one, it's not really upgraded or probably the on, uh, on-premise machines, then they can actually use uh, the respective versions accordingly there. So that is, uh, I would say, few steps before we are reaching to the postman, which we have to do this. And once I'm on the postman, what I have to do, you can create the environments there. And in the environments, yeah, you can provide uh, example. Um, you can create the variables, like you can provide the URLs here, you can provide the versions, you can provide the tenant ID. So tenant ID, you can get it from, uh, yeah, from multiple places. The easiest way, I think the tenant ID, to get the tenant ID, you can again go to your overview. And from here, you can get the tenant ID uh, from, from the Azure portal. Then uh, you can get the web API URL. Uh, you can create it so the base url api data then what was in so there are two options either uh, from from the admin from the developer window or the developer site you can directly put it there but i really want to make it configurable so if the another version is coming in futures or my uh, my crm instance is getting or data was instance is getting upgraded i shouldn't have any problem because then it will uh, i have to just update at one place um, in the callback or the fallback URL should be HTTP localhost. You can go, go with the IP numbers also. Uh, authentication URL is, it, is is a defined one. So you have to give the base login.microsoftonline.com. Then it's replaced with your tenant ID. Uh, OAuth 2 v2.0 and the token would, would remain same here. Then you have a client ID and the client secret. And this is something I would quickly go again to the uh, yeah, uh, to the Azure App Registration site. And here we have to uh, generate the client ID and the secret. So it's quite simple process. You have to simply go and give a name and then you have to decide like it's for 180 days, one year, um, three months, whatever. You or you can go with the custom also, like a specific date if you would like to see. Like example, you would like to share with the developers of your team and you know the developers will be in the team for another 45 days. Then you can cust you can give the custom dates also accordingly. So after 45 days, it will automatically expire and then later on, nobody can access it. Try to avoid giving a long dates like three years or something. Uh, I think renewal of the client secrets is always necessary. So yeah, client ID in the client secret, you will get it from there. You can uh, you can put it here. Uh, for the client secret, I specifically chosen uh, not the default one, but the secret one, so it cannot be visible with the naked eyes here. The next step is then you have to go to the collection. You have to create a collection there and because I have already created uh, just for the time sake. So what you have to do um, the first step here, you you can just create a request. And in the request, uh, just put anything right now with a get call or something um, on the on the parameters for the URLs. Go to the authorization tab, select the O2 from this drop down here. And then basically um, there, it, initially it will be empty. So nothing will be there. and then basically uh, this portion will also empty because I have already generated the token, so it's captured there. Um, header prefix, keep it by default, so you don't have to make any changes there uh, into the header prefix. Then after that, uh, you just give any name, like CDX demo, CDX demo token, whatever the name you would like to give it, you can give it here. Uh, keep it the grant type as a client uh, credentials. Uh, you can also mention the implicit, like you have to make some different settings for that one. You can also go, go with the password credentials. 
So password credential is basically uh, not a recommended way. It's a quick and dirty way, but if you really want to put your passwords in the client, uh, like user ID in the password, this is a way which we have to go. Then use the variables here directly instead of writing the hard coded like a client auth URLs, client ID, client secrets. Uh, for this scope, you just put the base URL slash dot default. Um, keep this every information in the header. Uh, so authentication header and then generate a new token. So once you generate the new token, a token will be generated and you can capture it or use it. Once the token has been generated, then you, you can try to making a default calls to just validate, okay, you did everything, is everything working fine or not, or you still get some error. So I have a, I have a URL written there, which is a base URL, then who am I? Let's try to send it here and see if I'm getting some, some responses there or not. So I could basically, um, yeah, just, I would wait for a second and see the request is going and if everything is fine, then I should be able to get the response back. So I get my user ID back, which business unit I'm the part of, what organization ID um, I'm the part of. So I get basically about myself that, okay, what I am and who I am, who is going to make the call to the system in the subsequent request. Yeah, you know me, but probably system don't know me. Uh, since the system don't know and system don't know anyone actually, until unless you are going to tell them that who you are. The next step is I'm trying to make a get call. Um, so simply the web API URLs retrieve total co record counts, uh, which entity. So I'm trying to pick all of the record count from the account entity. I can use the, the tokens there of uh, what has been already generated and then, yeah, then try to just make a call if it is coming or not, if it, uh, this is giving me the results. So I have a total four values there. I would like to quickly validate and I would go quickly to my account and see uh, I have not my active account, but basically all accounts. So I have totally the four values here. If I would create more or if I would uh, remove something, then I will get the counts accordingly. The second way, uh, because these are the get, uh, though both both the requests were in the get, I would try to really do it here. So what I did, I just again make the base URLs account and I'm trying to make or uh, insert or update some values in the existing record. So I'm basically trying to update the data there. What I did in the body, I just uh, put the overwrite creation date. I have, uh, I would like to update this. So then it can create, it can update the created date accordingly. And also I would like to update the website URL uh, with something. So right now just validate it in the system. What is the base URL there? So I will just quickly go and, and this is the account ID, which I'm talking about. So you can check it from the URL um, parameters. So this is exactly the account ID uh, which I'm trying to pass it here. And there is something, the website uh, address is www.preresearch.net slash dot. I would like to update it because I see, okay, there is an additional dot which it should not be there. And I just updated here, try to send it and hopefully it should run. And it gave me the updated results. So now you can see on the body, response body that I don't have a dot there. Let's just quickly revalidate into the system. So it's not something spoofed, but now you can see directly into the system, the dot is gone now. This is the way you can connect actually from, um, you know, the post, from the postman to your data was APIs. You can make a lot of operations there. It's not only limited to the get or the post. Um, it could be patch, it could be it could be anything. So you have a complete, um, you know, complete API documentation there. I would share with the video um, description link, uh, this all the things, um, all, all of the important notes there. But um, yeah, that would be a great way to start um, or the quick way to start when you are thinking from the pro dev perspective. Now in conclusion, um, you know, with the help of the Postman, the Microsoft data was APIs offer a flexible and the powerful way to interact with the data in the data was. So whether you are just getting started or you are, you are an experienced developer, the data was API can help you to build the robust data driven application, you know, even without using the interface or any of the app there. So stay tuned with us. And in upcoming episodes, probably we will be making walkthrough for all the possibilities to enhance, connect, and build the apps in the more pro dev way. Um, you can, you know, subscribe the channels and share the videos with your friend and colleagues. Um, and yeah, thank you from my side. And I would like to hand over now to Jorgen. Let's see what is in his bucket. 
Yes, thanks, Ambesh. And before I start with my topic, um, many thanks for your whole walkthrough. But I just saw or, or remembered that everyone is using uh, Power Platform Dynamics differently. So I saw that you you were using still the classic editor showing the web resources, and um, yeah, I know that not everyone is using uh, the classic editor anymore. So mm -hmm. also in the Maker portal, you have an easy access to the developer resources. Just click on the um, symbol here and go to yep. developer resources. And here you have also all the endpoints for your mm -hmm. API. So it's also a good um, possibility to get the information and you don't have to go back to the classic editor just to get the developer resources. Yeah, thanks, Jorgen, for sharing. I'm still into the old school model, so yeah. used to of the the interfaces. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot. And over to you. So, um, what I want to talk about today is um, something which is not so much known. Um, it's it's a feature that is also not available directly from Dynamics uh, itself. So you have to use uh, either the API or the XM toolbox, which is the way I will show today. And what I'm talking about is polymorphic lookup tables or multi-table lookups. So there are some um, out-of-the-box examples for this kind of lookups, um, especially if, if you think about um, records and ownerships. Um, we have the owner field, and this is, I would say, the most prominent example um, for multi-table lookup field, because um, if you go here and uh, we'll show it with the advanced lookups, and you can see it better. You can see that the owner field is referring once to the user table, and on the other hand, to the teams table. And you can either select a team or a user as the owner of a record. But there's no out of the box way to create your own custom um, multi uh, table lookup fields or polymorphic lookup tables, um, even though it's supported. So, um, you have to use the XM toolbox, and there's luckily a tool called Polymorphic Lookup Manager for the past one and a half, two years already. Um, but as I think, it's not so commonly known. So what could you do with it? You can use it to make a lookup to different tables. And one possibility is, for example, if you have, let's think about a project and you want to collect members of the project. So it could be either um, users of the system, but also contacts could be a part of um, um, of the members, or also Azure Active Directory users, so users inside the uh, organization without a Dynamics or uh, Power Apps license. And maybe you want to capture the member for approval flows. So you need to get the information um, somewhere, and this is an easy way to create a polymorphic um, look up. Before starting working with a polymorphic, polymorphic uh, lookup uh, manager in XM Toolbox, um, you need to do some preparations. So you need to have uh, a solution inside your environment because the uh, uh, polymorphic lookup manager will ask you for a solution where you're referring on, and you must know the table that you want to select. So I've created for me a new solution called Dataverse Multitable, and I will jump to the XM toolbox. You have to connect to your environment that you're looking for, and then starting the application within the XM toolbox. So now the metadata has been loaded from my environment, and I can find the Dataverse Multitable um, solution within uh, the Polymorphic Lookup Creator. Um, one one tip, um, always following the steps from top to bottom, because if you start below and then change back to a field uh, uh, before, then all the information that you might have already captured, like selecting the tables, etc., cetera, uh, will be gone and you have to re-enter it once you have changed something in the previous steps. So referencing table, I have created a table um, called uh, project with my um, credentials. So this will be CAB project. Um, selecting it. Now you can define if you want to create a new polymorphic lookup. 
or if you want to change an existing um, lookup, if you might have already created one before and you want to add uh, another table or remove a table or um, yeah, uh, redefine an existing lookup. Um, I will call it, as, as I said, a member. And the schema name will be automatically created and I will leave it to members ID. Um, as I'm in the solution, um, the, the lookup will be um, also getting my uh, um, publisher a prefix. So it will be created within the solution. And I can now select, for example, account, AD users. I can search for contact. And I also want the system users. And now I see that multiple tables have been selected. And all I need to do uh, is create polymorphic lookup. OK. Uh, there was an error. Let's restart. So create a new. I have to restart it. Sometimes it's a little bit buggy. I don't know why. It seems within a new update. Hopefully now it's working. Referencing table, I will use CAB project. I will say create new polymorphic members. And now I see here the lookup schema name is still CAB as I mentioned. Contact and system users. So let's try it again. And now it's working, creating the polymorphic lookup, and it directly shows you what it's doing. So it's first creating it, it's updating the solution and publishing everything. So you can then directly jump into the system, into the maker portal once it's published. Add it to a form and um, yeah, t test it out. Um, we need to wait a little bit. Um, so maybe if there are some um, question uh, to this session or to uh, to the sessions before from one of my co-speakers. I just um, want to praise this feature because it is so cool. Um, I've waited a long time for this, and when I started out, it was not there, and, and I was like, ah, we need this. And because you called it members, what you cannot do is what you do with parties, so that you set multiple records at yeah. once, and I'm still waiting for that feature to come. <laughs> so, um it's now said it's it's done and uh, I'm totally with you. So when I started with uh, with CRM, it, it wasn't there as well. So it's a feature for for the last one and a half two years available, and it's really a great other feature. And there there's also an even more interesting feature that is coming at the moment um, to Dataverse. Maybe next time I will talk about it, um, which I waited even longer. It's um, the possibility to uh, set multiple regarding elements um, on an activity table and referring it to itself. So there, there are some great news regarding this coming this year. So going back to the solution, um, I can go to my table now, to the columns. And if everything worked, I can now see that there is the members field. It's a it's a lookup. And if I go to the relationships, then you should see that here are several um, relationships created for members. And now let's go to the form. Add some members to the form. Yeah, yes, it's gone. A little bit slow today. 
I will just do it again. You were too quick. It popped up when you clicked leave. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, well, it's not working. Ah, there it is. And save and publish. A bit slow today. Okay, refreshing the page. at the projects table. And now I can see that I can, uh, these are all accounts. I have not at once look up. And here you can see I can select accounts, contacts, or users. Uh, and at these, to the project. But as you said, only one record is allowed at the moment, so I can either select um, a contact or an account. But that's what I meant. Um, now you have the possibility to select one member of the team and use this field, for example, in an approval workflow, and you can either decide, is it a contact you want to send the approval to, or a system user, or maybe also an AD user. Um, in the past, you had to place different lookup fields on the form um, and you had to specify that maybe only one um, could be filled and the others have them to be read only or hidden. Um, now you can use one field for this approach. So thanks everyone and yeah looking forward to the next session where we are sharing more topics. Oh, Handing over again. to yeah. Michael. I don't have anything today so to say today. <laughs> Do you have any questions? <laughs> so many, but I don't know where to start. <laughs> okay. I just remember when I saw that Ambush uh, was demonstrating the Dataverse API with a Postman, uh, that I remembered that uh, some time ago, I think last year or the year before last year, I started the Postman 30 days challenge, which is a really nice chance to get into APIs. How does it work? And for me, uh, they kind of lost me as I realized I need to learn some JavaScript or basically any kind of programming language that would have helped. And that was a blocker for me. But yeah, <laughs> still a cool challenge. It's still good to know because I, I, I talked to Ambish in the morning and um, I needed it yesterday, right? And he <laughs> asked me that exact question and I needed it yesterday uh, because people were asking from outside Dataverse, okay, they need to write the Dataverse. And okay, how do you get these people into this? And the easiest thing was, okay, I just make a Postman collection with this authorization and the the uh, sample request and okay you you hand it over they can they can use it and see real result they can make changes and so on and see it not work maybe and yeah that's that's just the strength of postman and <laughs> yeah yeah, exactly, because um, that's the same thing from where or we have just started or have basically started because a lot of our customers or the partners, they need to push the data, they need to read the data, especially if you work for the data integration projects. And at some point of time, you can't give the access via interfaces because um, then you need a licenses and um, yeah, there are a lot of, lot of governance there. The easiest way, create a Postman collection, what you mentioned, like put the fillers, put the sample um, request and the loads there, give it to them, they would play around. And yeah, then with, if everything done, it can be integrated to the real project. So quite a nice way to to explore that, that area as well. I wonder if that works, if you have switched tenant isolation on and not created an example connection for that. That's something I need to test, but that's basically an outbound connection or an inbound connection, depends on where you come. We should test that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would say um, stay tuned with us because in the next episode, probably we are going to talk more about the new and upcoming
features releases like the wave one feature releases so we are going to to look into that one we all i know we already started looking into that one but we need a time where we can compile everything and present for you guys so yeah just wait for that and by the time thank you so much for joining thanks all of you for your great time and support here for the community have a great day have a great night whenever you are listening the the videos and you are looking into this thank you Bye. Thanks for joining today.